Welcome to the WMED Specialty Spotlight Podcast, your virtual mentor for choosing a medical specialty and planning a career in medicine. On this podcast, we probe practicing physicians with questions about their specialty, the decision algorithm that helped them determine that the specialty was right for them, and then for advice about long-term career planning, irrespective of the field they went into. I'm your host, Dr. Bren Shaw, WMED Assistant Dean for Career Development. Just a quick reminder that the show notes for this episode and all episodes can be found on our website, wmed.edu forward slash specialty spotlight. The specialty of today's show is psychiatry. And the physician here to tell us about it is Dr. Madhvi Lata Nagala. Dr. Madhvi Lata Nagala is a residency program director of the Psychiatry Residency Program and Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine. After completing her medical degree from Guntur Medical College in Andhra Pradesh, India, she went on to complete a psychiatry residency at NASA University Medical Center in East Meadow, New York. Dr. Nagala then went on to complete a psychosomatic medicine fellowship at the University of Michigan and simultaneously did a psychotherapy fellowship with the Michigan Psychoanalytic Institute in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Prior to coming to WMED, she led a mother-baby partial hospitalization program, the second of its kind in the nation for almost seven years. Dr. Nagala is looking forward to bringing that expertise into the Kalamazoo area by building a perinatal collaborative care model. So without further ado, Dr. Madhu Nagala. Dr. Nagala, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Shah. And the way I like to start off is by reading you a description of your specialty from the Careers in Medicine website which is hosted by the Association of American Medical Colleges. A psychiatrist specializes in the evaluation and treatment of mental, addictive, and emotional disorders such as schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, substance-related disorders, sexual and gender identity disorders, and adjustment disorders. How much of that do you agree with? And what would you add or subtract to ensure that anyone listening was well informed of the practice of psychiatry? I think that definition or that description is very inclusive of the various psychiatric disorders that psychiatrists uh, treat. Um, and help their patients with. Uh, but if I have to add something to it, and perhaps this is actually a reflection of how psychiatry training has changed over the course of time. I would perhaps add that psychiatrists who are interested in pursuing a practice focused in psychotherapy can actually help patients or clients live their lives to the fullest potential. So it's not just about disorders, but it is also about any condition that is actually being a barrier for a person to live their lives fully. I think a psychiatrist will be able to help them. So in addition to the disorders per se, I will say a psychiatrist can help clients live their life to the fullest potential. What does a typical weekly routine look like? And you can change that time frame to whatever is most conducive for your answer. What is the typical series of patients that you would see and what are the typical outcomes of these patients? So I think it might be best for me to answer that question thinking about three different environments an inpatient environment, an outpatient environment, and then um, the environment of consultation liaison psychiatry. 
So for the inpatient psychiatric unit, that's the place wherein you your patients are really sick. We have really sick patients with um, mood symptoms wherein they they really are severely depressed that they want to end their lives uh, or they are so angry and you know they they want to hurt somebody else and they're not able to control those feelings and that's why they're in an inpatient setting or you know they uh, they're experiencing severe psychotic symptoms they're experiencing hallucinations they're experiencing delusions to an extent, again, that the way they are responding to those symptoms is actually putting themselves at harm or putting others at harm um, or, you know, severe mania, wherein they're actually being very intrusive and that could be dangerous too. So you have your inpatient unit with these really sick patients. And your typical day or week, like usually, it, it what, what it uh, encompasses would be a lot of interprofessional work on inter, in in um, in psychiatry. I think the nurses and the patient care providers are actually the key members to this team. They are the ones who are with the patient at all times on the unit, and so it's very important to have them as a part of your team. Your social workers your group leaders who run some groups on the units. So all of the all of these people are active members of the team. And I think it's very important for the psychiatrist to coordinate and collaborate with uh, all these team members. Something else that is very unique about inpatient psychiatry, I would say is there are patients on the unit against their will. Those are your involuntary patients, right? So if you think about yeah. all these patients who are really sick, who are involuntarily there, not against their will, you can just imagine how active the unit is. So it's, uh, it, uh, and on, on that active unit, having all these uh, various team members as a part of your team every day, you round on your patients, you make the medication changes as appropriate, always coordinating care with the family members and making sure that you are able to come up with uh, a decent discharge plan, um, making sure that this excellent care that you did on the inpatient unit can be continued on the outpatient side also, right? I mean, it's very important that they are connected with some sort of a psychiatrist or therapist on the outside. They have some sort of a stable living situation. And if they don't have a stable living situation, how are we going to take that into consideration while we are planning our discharge? So I think, so these would be the main day-to-day um, -day things on an inpatient psychiatric unit. And like I said, because patients are here against their will, we actually have court hearings to make sure that, you know, there is a judge and the patient gets an opportunity to talk to the judge about why they think they should not be here. And then the psychiatrist makes a case about why they should be here. So the inpatient psychiatric treatment team, uh, there is, it's it's very active. Things are constantly happening. Um, and again, and that is why this is the place wherein we want to keep the patients for the least amount of uh, time, like, you know, only the time that it's absolutely required. And from there, we want them to be discharged to an outpatient care setting wherein they can be followed by a psychiatrist or a therapist. Usually outpatient psychiatry will be like, you know, um, your new patients will be approximately one to one and a half hour evaluations. And then the follow up patients will be about like 30 minute evaluations. And then if you want to practice psychotherapy, you still can see patients for an hour long um, and uh, incorporate that into your practice. But again, mm -hmm. I think that describes outpatient psychiatry. And again, like I said, here again, you see the same kind of symptoms, depression, anxiety, mania, and psychosis, but, you know, obviously not to that really sick extent wherein there is a harm to themselves or others. And that's, if that's the scenario, they're inpatient, but then once they are sort of improving, they're in the outpatient setting. And then the third environment is the consultation liaison psychiatry. And I would describe that usually as just how, just like any other consultant role, like 
we the medical and surgical teams they have a question they call psychiatry psychiatry goes in like you know pr provides the answer for the question and the bread and butter usually in consultation psychiatry are delirium and uh, capacity evaluations do you think that most psychiatry practices it's a combination of both inpatient outpatient um, or or do you have different practices where it's primarily inpatient um, or primarily outpatient? I think that's the beauty of uh, psychiatry. I think you can you can you can do what you however you want it to be. If you are somebody who loves outpatient psychiatry, you can do that eight to five every single day, and you know that will be what you want to do. And then if you are interested in patient psychiatry, you can work for a hospital and just do that. Like, you know, um, usually again, I think eight to five, but that might entail some call in the evenings or over the weekends, that kind of thing. I'll also say this inpatient psychiatry as well as outpatient psychiatrists, they also can like, you know, carve out time for other things, like, for example, our inpatient psychiatry team, um, we have two inpatient psychiatrists here at WMED who, um, who do ECT. Similarly, if you want to have TMS as a part of your practice or if you want to cut down your time between inpatient and outpatient, I think you can just carve it out the way you want it to be. And for our listeners um, that may not know what ECT is, uh, electric electroconvulsive therapy. therapy and uh, you used uh, other terms transcranial trans magnetic stimulation TMS stimulation. yes great what do you find most exciting about your specialty and conversely what do you consider most mundane about your specialty of psychiatry with inpatient psychiatry the excitement lies in the fact of the significant improvement of symptoms with the introduction of medicines. And then in outpatient psychiatry, the excitement is in, or I should say the challenge actually, is in making some adjustments to these medications in order to help the patients with any side effects that are experiencing, or like, you know, um, they might have, um, they might not be having these overt suicidal thoughts or homicidal thoughts, but still their sleep is not the way it used to be, or they're still feeling slightly anxious about something. So making some adjustments in the medications in order to address those residual symptoms, which by the way, is not easy at all. It's a, it's a very challenging task. And then I think the excitement in outpatient psychiatry is, is the long-term relationships, obviously, that you will have with the patients. Um, it's nice to be a part of their graduations. Uh, you know, if they get married, you know, their first child, their second child, um, like, a, uh, so their job, like, you know, all of those exciting events in their life. So it's very nice to be a part of it. If I look back over the course of the last few years, Brexin alone is the only medication that came out with a, a new mechanism of action in for the for, for the field of psychiatry. I think every other most other medications that came out, I mean, they are still in the SSRI, SNRI class, they are still in the dopamine blockade class. So I think the fact that there is a lot of research happening, and I'm really hopeful that we are going to see further advancements and newer mechanisms of actions for the medications, but I think that fact that we are still in the SSRI, SNRI, dopamine blocker world uh, for treating our symptoms, I, 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 I hope that we can have more exciting um, medication options for our patients soon. How difficult is it to get prior authorization for treatment from insurances and psychiatry? Because one of one of the first things that I've learned about psychiatry is that you know most of the diagnosis of of in psychiatry is based on clinical observation, clinical assessment, um, meaning you don't have any diagnostic tests that can point to a lab result that says yes that that supports my diagnosis of X. Uh, it's it's really having to rely on the DSM five 
the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that really serves as a guideline to reaching a clinical diagnosis rather than a, an exact quantitative test to make that diagnosis. So how difficult have you found it to be working with insurances to get that pre-authorization? I used to work in a partial hospitalization program, which is also called a day program, um, slightly different from the inpatient setting, but still uh, provides like almost a five to six hour uh, long treatment every day for a, for a decent period of time. And that's what a partial hospitalization program is. Anyways, um, when in order to get insurance approvals, for the patients to stay in the partial hospitalization program, the simple words of they're experiencing depressive symptoms or, you know, they have even like, you know, they're having difficulty caring for themselves and their child was sometimes not enough. I actually had to break it down to like, when was their last shower? When did they actually like last brush their teeth? Like it, it, it really had to break down to how significantly these symptoms are affecting their day-to-day -day life. Um, and it's only then that we would get the insurance authorization or approval for the continued stay in the hospital. So, and, and I think that's another challenge in psychiatry wherein you, you want diagnosis to be your common language to communicate everything that you want to communicate. But unfortunately, that's not what or where diagnosis is at this point of time, and you still rely upon symptoms as a way to communicate uh, your uh, client's needs. But for documentation purposes, you're required to put in, again, the diagnosis. So even in the residency training, like, you know, it, uh, you have to make an argument or a case for your residents to actually understand that it's still important to know your DSM criteria, though when you are actually doing your day to day work, you are you're using more uh, symptom kind of a language. Um, so, yeah, like to answer your question, prior authorization is indeed a, a big issue. How do you feel about being in a specialty um, where you don't have diagnostic tests and everything is kind of sort of nebulous? I mean, some of the things are less nebulous than others, but you don't have those diagnostic tests and that's kind of the world that you live in. Um, I'm kind of wondering how you feel about that. When I actually talk about um, psychiatry with medical students, something that I emphasize is, like it or not, psychiatry is a social science. It is an art more so than, you know, a science, you know, that so it is, you have to come to terms with these aspects before you come into the field. And, and I take pride in it, actually. I take pride in the fact that my interviewing style is just unique to me and I am going the way I talk to the patient is actually going to be helpful for me to come to a proper diagnosis. It actually emphasizes the importance of developing good interviewing techniques and skills and that actually is the most important thing in training. We, 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 we learn that and in psychiatry, we encourage residents and learners to work with as many attendings as possible just for that reason, because every attending has their own style. And you as uh, a psychiatrist, you need to develop your own style and you're going to like pick from every person that you see, see what, and then like put it together into something that is your style. Um, and then you come up with your own unique style. And I think, that's that's the that's the nature of the field and i think that's what fascinates those of us who actually are in psychiatry at the same time i will admit that there are days for me when i'm like if only i knew exactly what's happening right i mean there is, i do admit that there mm -hmm. are days like that i don't know if we will get there i mean i know that there are a, there's a lot of 
uh, research and advancements that are happening in the field of neuroscience. I mean, imaging techniques that are coming out these days that could be helpful for us. So we might get there one day, but as of now, I will say that I actually take pride in the fact that my, my field is actually an art, at least to some extent. I intuit that your connections with patients are probably more intense than the average connection that a physician will have with a patient, but physicians from all specialties connect with patients sometimes in a very intimate way. What do you think is unique about the connection that a psychiatrist has with his or her patient that is different qualitatively and quantitatively than other specialties that get to also connect very substantially with patients? As far as the amount of time that a patient spends with a psychiatrist, I, I would say it is definitely uh, more compared to like a patient's encounter with other specialists. So I think obviously that will play a role in the relationship, but more importantly, I think it is the way that the psychiatrists use that relationship, the way that they use the dynamic that's happening between them and the patient, that uh, that, that is what I think is unique uh, with how psychiatry differs from the other fields. We look at that dynamic that's happening in our office or in our encounter, that dynamic that's between the psychiatrist and the patient as a parallel process of this patient's relationships on the outside. So we are able to take that dynamic and sort of use it in actually understanding how this person is responding or reacting to other life circumstances, sort of based on where the patient is, identify them with the patient, talk to them more about it and help them understand it. And in that way, actually provide some techniques to help them work on their relationships better on the outside. What would be the one thing that you would have wished you would have known before entering into psychiatry? And what would you encourage a medical student to think about in earnest before committing to going into psychiatry? When I decided upon psychiatry, I actually was still in India and actually wanting to come to the US were, or or going to come to the US was one of the reasons why I you know, was able to decide upon psychiatry. I was thinking of psychiatry as one of my options, but uh, going to come here was actually one of the reasons why I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to do psychiatry then. So my idea of what psychiatry was, was the, the, the classical traditional way, which is like the psychoanalytic therapy. That's, I thought that's what my psychiatry training was going to be. Um, and I don't know, I think I was not as smart as the current students that we have because these days every student actually asks us those questions in the interview. I never even asked that question in my residency interview about like what is the balance between psychopharm and you know like psychotherapy or anything. I, I did not even think of asking that question I guess. And there I go in, I start my residency training and then I realize that Ah, this is not what I was thinking, right? So um I still I, I learned a lot in my training. I'm 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 really happy as to uh all the psychopharm foundations that I have had. And and still, you know, though it was not like a completely psychoanalytically focused training, my program director and chair, both of them were psychoanalytically trained. So we did have a lot of training incorporated to some extent, not to the extent I was imagining. But anyways, so I would encourage uh, the medical students who are thinking about going into psychiatry now to, to understand what is it that they like about psychiatry, because um, 
if they like the procedures for, you know, it, they might find it fascinating now that they still they have some procedural interventional psychiatry techniques like ECT, TMS, um, like the electroconvulsive therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, deep brain stimulation, the ketamine treatments. Like you know, there are some things like that, or you know, there uh, there are programs. Definitely, I wouldn't say completely psychoanalytically focused, but definitely more focused. And then you do have opportunity to pursue on the side through like a psychoanalytic institute in your state, uh, a psychoanalytic training, uh, you can you can pursue that. Um, or if you are interested in biological uh, psycho uh, psychopharm kind of a foundational training, there are programs which are definitely more focused on that. There are programs which are focused on neuroscience. Um, so I think today I would encourage the medical students like try to think about what is what aspect of psychiatry is that you find fascinating and every training program will definitely have a little bit of everything. But then perhaps you want to go into a program that definitely focuses most on what is the most important thing for you. Can you define and for our of our listeners, what is psychoanalysis and, and then psychotherapy? The way I would think about psychoanalysis is it's actually a form of psychotherapy, but it basically is rooted in the concepts of what, like all of us are motivated by by some unconscious desires and thoughts. And it is those desires and thoughts that sort of predict our behaviors or responses. And I think that's a very important aspect to understand in the field of psychiatry because whatever those unconscious desires and thoughts are, are going to constantly creep in. So for example, you have a, a new, a first time mother, uh, like com uh, coming to you reporting significant anxiety. Um, she has this constant fear that, you know, the baby is going to develop sits and, you know, uh, and die or so, uh, several other significant concerns and then, She's never uh, uh, separating from the baby at all, so much so that she's not able to like take care of herself, though help is being offered to her. We can actually, the, the, uh, we, we will never know the answer, but perhaps something to think about is what was her childhood like? What was the kind of parenting she had? Was it could be the same kind of parenting that she actually, like, you know, it could be a parent like completely hovering over her that might be the childhood experience she had and perhaps that's what she knows and that's what was modeled to her and that's what she's actually doing right now or it could actually be something completely different it could be that the parents were never available for this mother and then this mother is now actually making sure that she's always available for her uh, baby so Again, these are all interpretations. These are all ideas and suggestions. But then this th all this kind of conversation trying to tap into the unconscious memories and thoughts. That's I think would be the best definition I can give for psychoanalysis if that's helpful. So for other specialties such as diagnostic radiology in my field, you could practice diagnostic radiology internationally. You could actually read cases, teleradiology um, from other countries. And you could do that for probably other specialties as well, like orthopedics, uh, going to a, a different country and being able to practice the specialty of orthopedics in that country. But for psychiatry, I would imagine it's probably different in that you're dealing with the psychosocial aspect, the language, uh, and then religion uh, as well, religious beliefs that, that patients have. And I, I just wanted to get your sense whether you agree to that being a challenge for psychiatry or, or, or not. 
I think you hit on all the barriers that I could think of to practice psychiatry in an international way um, in order to uh, have a good understanding of why a person is reacting or responding in a certain manner, we need to understand the culture around them. We need to understand what the societal norms are. We need to understand what's acceptable religious practice before we jump to conclusions as to, uh, before we identify something as pathological, that could be a norm in that society. So I think it's very important to understand those factors being culturally sensitive definitely is helpful, but I do think it's not just being culturally sensitive or culturally curious. It is a true understanding of the culture that is important when we are treating patients. So that along with the language, I mean, conversation, talking is definitely an important part of our encounters and treatment. And if you are not able to speak the same language as your patient, I do think that that is a huge barrier. If I'm trained in an English speaking country, for me to practice psychiatry in a non-English speaking country, the language is outright a barrier in addition to all the social and cultural aspects of that place, which perhaps I'm completely ignorant about. Do, do you see any, any physicians, your colleagues or at other institutions going abroad and, and actually practicing psychiatry or or do you not really see that very often at all i have a few friends who do locums and they're all u.s trained psychiatrists and they are able to practice in new zealand uk australia and i think some of them even work in germany but i think in germany they are actually uh serving the American citizens or the English speaking people who have settled there. But other than that, I I don't know. I actually wanted to at one point in my life, uh, I wanted to like just go around the world. And I was like, if I go to France and try to practice psychiatry, I'm not going to do it <laughs> because I cannot speak French and that would be a huge barrier. What's the biggest challenge facing psychiatry and where do you predict psychiatry will be in 10 to 20 years from now? I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I do really uh, believe that one of the biggest challenges in psychiatry is the concept of diagnosis. The, I mean, I, we do need diagnosis and, you know, uh, diagnosis, uh, it's always nice to have like a name for the experiences that somebody is going through and having that name or a label actually is very empowering. It will help with starting conversations amongst, you know, the clients themselves, but also this will be a, a, a diagnosis which is the language that even providers use to communicate where the patient is as far as the treatment is. I think, you know, it's very important to have that. But I think especially in psychiatry though, diagnosis can be very challenging because it can be very subjective and it can be open to interpretation in multiple ways. And sometimes I'm even more concerned with diagnosis actually taking out the curiosity piece, meaning like if you have a diagnosis, like somebody's experiencing um, hallucinations, delusions, and you would think that, okay, like, you know, that now they're checking off this criteria, this criteria, this criteria, and oh yeah, they did have a schizophrenia diagnosis in the past. So now this is schizophrenia multiple episodes currently in an acute episode, right? I think, I think it's very easy to go down that route and perhaps 
not be curious about the person's specific and individual experiences. How can we still treat symptoms as symptoms? And if they fit into a diagnosis, that's awesome. But if they do not fit into a diagnosis, we should be very good at not just trying to somehow fit them into a box. Because once we start doing that, there is the problem with misdiagnosis and multiple diagnosis, which can result in polypharmacy and unnecessary medication treatments. So I do hope that, you know, the big good brains in psychiatry are thinking about all of these concerns. And, you know, when they're thinking about diagnosis um, and the future diagnostic manuals, hopefully they take into consideration all these concerns that are expressed by several practicing psychiatrists. As far as like where the field is going to go in the next 10 or 20 years, again, I think we talked a little bit about this earlier, but I mean, there is so much research and advancement that's happening in the field. There are days when I think that we are very close to understanding the exact neural pathways for most of our conditions. But then I think there are days when I think, will we ever get there? I don't, I, th I think uh, the brain is such a complex organ. I don't, sometimes I think that we might not actually be able to ever find that that neural mm -hmm. pathway exactly. But I'm very glad for all the work that's actually happening to see how we can um, get there. So all in all, I think that I'm glad that that's, there's a lot of work that's going on, but there is a part of me that believes that 10 to 20 years from now, still interviewing techniques and listening uh, are going to be the most important aspects uh, in psychiatry. Do you feel that there's going to be difficulty of physicians that are trained in psychiatry having to compete with uh, nurse practitioners that are also trained in psychiatry. Uh, you have psychologists that have masters or PhDs and uh, independent counselors. Do, do you think that there's a competition? When it comes to nurse practitioners and physician assistants and psychiatrists, because these these are the group of people who are actually able to prescribe medications, at least currently that's in Michigan. I don't think psychologists can prescribe medications now uh, here in Michigan. Um, so I think I'm really grateful for the uh, for the physician assistants and the nurse practitioners that we have in the field. And um, when I work, was work, when I was working in the mother baby partial hospitalization program, I worked very closely with the nurse practitioner and she worked with me for approximately six to seven years. And because of working for that long in that particular setting and treating so many patients over the course of like seven years with those issues, I actually, when it comes to treating perinatal patients, I trust her judgment more than even some psychiatrists who have not had any exposure to perinatal psychiatry training. And, you know, those might be the psychiatrists who actually, there are still some psychiatrists who discontinue medications once they come to psychotropic medications, once they come to know that their patient is pregnant. Um, or they completely will say, oh, stop it. If you're lactating, this is not the best medicine, which is not the guidelines that we have right now. So here you have a psychiatrist who has gone to medical school, and I would rely more on my nurse practitioner who has worked in that specific area for that, uh, for that period of time. Similarly, um, I think, you know, currently we have one of our physician assistants who works in the Borges emergency room. And again, because of the experience that she has had working in the emergency room, I think she does a good job compared to like several other psychiatrists who have not been in like acute uh, crisis situations because they have done telehealth or they have done outpatient psychiatry for quite some time I have, and they have not been exposed to these uh, violent situations or crisis situations that you usually see in the ED. So 
I really appreciate the physician assistants and nurse practitioners in that manner. That said, I do think psychiatrists, because of their experience of having gone to medical school, they definitely will, uh, with all due respect to everybody, I do think, you know, there is more of, uh, there is a more comprehensive understanding of some complicated situations, especially if it is a scenario that, that you're not exposed to do very well, like, right? So if this is a first time occurrence that you're seeing, I think with your medical background, you will be able to have a more comprehensive assessment and formulation of the patient. And I think that's definitely important. But again, I am really grateful for the experienced and seasoned physician assistant and nurse practitioners who actually are helping quite a few people in the community. There is no way that psychiatrists can uh, meet with all the demands that we have in the community right now, right? So then when it comes to psychologists and social workers, again, I don't want to even put all of them in one, uh, one class because I think everybody has their own unique uh, talents. People with a social work background, they are really good with counseling. And then you have psychologists who are extreme, they, they have got, they have uh, se uh, several years of training with psychotherapy and they and so they some of them might be like uniquely specialized in cognitive behavioral therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy or you know some of them are trained psychoanalytic uh, uh therapists and so i think everybody has their own unique strength and that is why it is very important for everybody to work as a team I don't see them as competitors at all. I see them all as being able to work in a team together and that way provide care and access to a lot more people in the community. Do you feel or in your practice um, as well as your colleagues, are, are they um, as well as yourself utilizing telepsychiatry services? Is that something that you're seeing that's getting to be more and more common? Oh, definitely. I think, and I think COVID has taught us all something that, you know, uh, necessity makes us do a lot more things that, you know, we would never think of doing. I mean, I still will argue, I am missing something out in the televisits. Um, I, I still do think that if I have a patient in my office, like that connection that I will have with that patient is entirely different from the connection that I can establish with the patient over, uh, over virtual environment. However, if this patient is in the up north area, five hours away from here, and if I am the only resource that they have, like I think it's important to weigh the, uh, the risks mm -hmm. and benefits of what we are doing and sort of yeah. do what's the right thing to do. So yes, it's not ideal perhaps, but I do think it's definitely improving access and I think that's amazing. One of the things that people say is that a psychiatrist isn't a real doctor. They sort of given up everything that they've learned about medicine. And I was wondering, how would you respond to that statement? It depends upon how you define a real doctor. For example, if you think of somebody who's able to run a code as a real doctor, I totally agree with the person saying that psychiatrists are not real doctors, I guess, because mm -hmm. I would not want a psychiatrist running a code on any of my family members or on me when mm -hmm. if I need it ever. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if you remember, there was a meme that was going around during COVID, which basically said, if you don't want a psychiatrist to intubate you, wear your mask or something along those lines. And, and there is some truth to it. So I, I see where those people are coming from. But then if you define health as how WHO defines it, which basically is physical, mental, and social well-being, and if you describe somebody who actually can help a person achieve that health status as a doctor, who else is a better real doctor than a psychiatrist? How often 
would you say that a psychiatrist would use uh, their physical diagnosis or physical exam? If you look at the diagnostic manual, that is actually the criteria for every single psychiatric condition. A medical condition should be eliminated before you act actually thinking this to be a psychiatric diagnosis. So, for example, somebody is coming in with, a, with, a, with psychotic symptoms for the first time in their life, never had any psychotic symptoms, right? And there is no substance use in the picture right now. I am not going to say that they have schizophrenia. I'm going to like, you know, try to understand what is it? Is there something organic that's going on? Is there a neurological condition that's actually contributing to this? Is there, uh, is hypothyroidism actually so very severe in this person that it is actually presenting as psychosis at this point of time? Or is this actually delirium that we are seeing so and are we completely missing delirium here like so it's very important to actually rule out the medical condition in order to rule in a psychiatric condition so it's very important to have that knowledge and i think all our psychiatrists you definitely like pay attention to that i think what many people talk about when they are saying that you know we don't we don't use a lot of the medical skills, quote unquote. Um, I would say, I think perhaps they're talking about the physical exam piece. We do do physical exams, but perhaps not to the extent that other fields do. I mean, we do a basic neurological exam. That's very important. Um, we, we definitely um, don't do, read EKGs on a regular basis. We don't uh, look at images like, you know, the CAT scans or the MRIs on a regular basis. I mean, I think there is a, uh, a different level of motivation that is required if you want to like keep up with those skills and and I agree to that. What resources would you recommend students to use to learn more about the specialty? American Psychiatric Association, their website, you know, they have they have like a education page, I guess, and that's actually a really good place to look at. And all specialties of psychiatry, like addiction psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, consultation lies on psychiatry, forensic psychiatry, addiction, they all have like really good, um, uh, th all these specialties have organizations and all organizations have really good web pages and those are like those are really good resources to understand like what's happening um, in those areas and you know they're all I mean as perhaps in many other fields medical student registration for any lectures or courses or any meetings is zero so they all encourage like you know all the, the medical students to uh, to attend the conferences or participate in the uh, in the online courses that they have so I, I do think medical students should take advantage of that talk to your attendings like you know it could be me it could be any of the other attendings that that you have here like everybody has their own unique uh niches like for example like i i think i i, uh, I shared that i worked in perinatal psychiatry for some time so that's sort of my niche but then we do have other psychiatrists that have done a lot of outpatient work have done clinical research quite a bit, have practiced more of the addiction psychiatry. We do have one of our psychiatrists actually practices hypnotherapy. So like I think wow. uh, uh, just reaching out to the uh, attendings in our department and talking to them, I think is going to be really helpful too. Can you tell me how you came to the decision that psychiatry was right for you? When I was in medical school, I strongly debated between OBGYN and uh, psychiatry. I think what attracted me about the OB population was how, how motivated they were um, in being the best version of themselves for their child. And so I, I thought that was very, very attractive for me and I wanted to be a part of that journey. And then with psychiatry, um, obviously in psychiatry you have uh, patients uh, who are experiencing symptoms and might not even want our help, but there are also uh, 
uh, a big group of people who actually want the help of psychiatrists in order to basically live their life to the fullest. They understand that a psychiatrist can help them in that process. And I really wanted to, again, work with that highly motivated group, um, along with like, you know, um, patients who are experiencing severe symptoms and be able to like bring a change in their life that could bring back their functionality in a, almost a miraculous way, I would say. So I, I was strongly debating between the both of them. It was very hard for me to decide. But then I think actually nature helped me there. Um, due to some life circumstances, I knew I, I, I had to come to US. And when I knew that I was going to come to United States, it was a no brainer for me. If I'm going to go to the United States for advanced training in any field of medicine, in my head, that was going to be psychiatry. So uh, that's how I was like, okay, I'm going to go into um, psychiatry. But once I came into psychiatry, I enjoyed the, my training. I mean, I can confidently tell you that today I am a better person than I was 10 years ago just because of my psychiatric training and my psychiatric practice. I, I, I am very proud of that. But along this journey, there were times when I had that itch of, oh, what would it have been like if I went into the ob field? And I'm very fortunate to say that um, early in my career, I was able to work with Dr. Maria Music. She works with um, the perinatal population. Um, trauma in the perinatal population is her is is the main focus of her work. And uh, working with her, I think I found my uh, passion again of uh, being able to work with highly motivated women who want to be the best version of themselves for their children. So I'm really glad of how things fell in place for me. What is a career mistake that you have seen other physicians make? And what is something you have seen another physician do well that has made you want to emulate it? I don't know about like other people's mistakes, but I can definitely share with you something that I think about occasionally when I reflect back on my own 10 years of practice. I'm really glad as to where I am right now, but I do think nature helped me quite a bit and things fell in place the way they should for me. I did not plan a lot. Like for example, um, I think I shared earlier that I was interested in women's health in general, but then because of circumstances, I came into psychiatry, but I did not plan a lot about how to incorporate women's health into my psychiatric practice. It sort of happened to me. Um, it fell in my lap and I'm so blessed for that happened. And I wonder how I would be feeling today if that did not fall in place for me. Um, I think I might not be as happy as I am if I was not able to focus a little bit on perinatal psychiatry over the years of my practice. So something that I would share is that I think there is some benefit in sort of going with the flow of things. But I do think um, there is planning is also very important um, in order to make sure that you are uh, going in the right direction in your career. If you're a student, what do you think that they could do? Could they come see you? Could they see your colleagues? Do you, do you feel strongly that that would be the best or how, what advice would you give to a student yeah. in terms of planning and as you said? Talking to your mentors is very, very important. And sometimes, you know, things might not 
work out the way you want them to work out for some reason, but still having a, a, a decent root plan of how you want things to go, I do think is very important. Not that we should be very rigid about it, but I do think having a decent understanding is important. And I don't think there is any better way other than talking to uh, people who are already experienced. And, you know, um, I, I think that's the best way to do it. And what would you say that you've seen a, a physician do that you'd want to emulate that? Over the past 14 years, I have seen three physicians who I would describe as the jack of all trades, I guess. Like the other day, I think I was even looking up uh, the word that would describe that. And I think it's actually called polymath. Like these are people who have a decent knowledge. Perhaps they, they don't know all the details, but they have a decent knowledge on a vast variety of subjects. And when I say vast, it's golf, music, painting, space, rock like fishing, like whatever, right? It's a wonderful quality because they, their knowledge of all those subjects and all areas, especially in the field of psychiatry, I have seen how that can actually help them in building a relationship with the patient. I, I really uh, think that once I started medical school, I mean, obviously my books, my psychiatry training, CMEs, all of that. And, you know, I have two, three hobbies that I definitely keep up with. But I, I am not that jack of all trades person. <laughs> so I think that is something that I want to work upon a little bit more, uh, keeping my mind open to various subjects like, you know, go to a YouTube channel and watch anything that comes on it just to like, you know, have for the fun of it, I guess. Yeah. I don't know how I'm going to improve that knowledge. But I do think having that knowledge on a wide array of subjects is really helpful, I think, for any physician, uh, but definitely more so for a psychiatrist. What is one book medical or non-medical that you think every person pursuing a career in medicine should read? This is the first unabridged book I read, and that's uh, The Citadel by A.J. Cronin. I really love that book. Cronin is actually a, a physician, so I mean, it, it really comes across in the book. The book is the journey of a young doctor very passionate about like you know and you can really see what a passionate doctor does like how how do they interact with patients how do they take care of the public health issues and how they get involved and then over the course of his life how he changes how some other materialistic factors start playing a more important role in his life and then something else like bringing this person back to like feeling grounded so it's it's a beautiful story and actually this is the first book where i read about psychosis secondary to hypothyroidism <laughs> so this is my book with like you know the psychosomatic presentation and then mm -hmm. this book also covers quite a few medical ethics concepts and principles which when i first read it i was like wow like this is like mind-boggling but anyways the citadel by aj cronin dr nagala i really appreciate you talking with me I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Dr. Madhvi Lata Nagala. For the resources and other tidbits that were mentioned in this episode, you can find them in the show notes on the WMED website, wmed.edu forward slash specialty spotlight. If you liked what you heard, please share this episode with your fellow medical students, especially if they're having some career anxiety. It truly is my hope that these conversations with physicians who've been there and done that will help you move forward with your own career choices. For any questions or if you would like to reach out to me for any reason, which I encourage you to do, 
You can do so by emailing me at bren.shaw at wmed.edu. But until next time, take care.